Okay, so we're going to shift gears and talk again about kind of general concepts because the topic of this course is common prayers and practices. So it's good to know that behind the scenes, there's a whole internal structure and scaffolding of Tantra that's not explicitly written out in the practice texts. So there's a whole philosophy and psychology and kind of process going on that you don't really know about unless you hear commentary or you read up on it or your teacher tells you these kind of things. But I think even if you don't practice Tantra or you don't have a tantric empowerment, but you're doing Tantra in a beginner's way, it's useful to know some of the background scaffolding. So what I'm going to explain to you guys is okay for a general audience of people that respect Buddhism. It's maybe not something to talk about as freely with people who don't respect Buddhism. Um, the philosophy of Tantra in Buddhist Tantra is always a Mahayana motivation. So there is no Tantra in Buddhism that is not Mahayana. Mahayana and Tantra go together. Basically, the Mahayana motivation is may I become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. The tantric Mahayana motivation is may I become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings quickly. Yeah, <laughs> like we were talking about yesterday with the two kinds of bodhicitta prayers. So how do you become enlightened quickly? You do the resultant vehicle. You take the result as the path. But to take the result as the path without getting kind of um, ungrounded or um, confused takes a very, very stable mind and takes at least a conviction and respect for renunciation, bodhicitta, and correct view. So the three principal aspects of the path are fundamental to any kind of tantric practice in Buddhism. Without the three principal aspects of the path, this amazing medicine can become poison. Um, a lot of tantric iconography is confusing, and that's sometimes it can be off-putting, sometimes it can be intriguing. But what's important to understand about tantric iconography in Buddhism is that it's symbolic of transforming the energy that accompanies negative states of mind the energy that accompanies attachment, the energy that accompanies anger. So we're not really encouraging attachment or anger, we're using the energy that accompanies those things in tantric practice. We're purifying negativities like attachment and anger. So you'll see deities who are, you know, like a halo of flames with all sorts of weapons trampling on people and you think, that doesn't seem very Buddhist, you know, aren't we nonviolent? What's up with the weapons and the fire and the scary face and the demons? What's going on? And you might think, oh, it's just some sort of cultural throwback from their connection with the Bun tradition. Oh, it's just some sort of Tibetan wildness. No, it's not. It's from the Buddha. And um, it's intentional and it's powerful, but it's easy to misunderstand. So underneath or behind the scenes of all of your practices are what are called practices to do with taking the result as the path called the four purities. And I think a lot of this will ring bells for you guys, even if you've never seen them kind of explicitly signposted. Um, so I'll go through them, but please do ask questions um, as I do. Okay, so this is from His Holiness. He says, Engaging in a path with similar features to the resultant state of Buddhahood, especially the form body, has great significance and power. It is also indispensable. Tantra speaks of the path being similar to the fruit in four ways. These are technically known as the four complete purities. So this path being similar to the fruit sometimes is glossed as ripening through rehearsal or taking the result as the path. These are all uh, ways of framing what tantric practice is. So these four complete purities are only practiced by those who have the appropriate tantric empowerment. For those of you that don't have the tantric empowerment, just know that that's what's going on behind the scenes. And maybe you develop some kind of affinity and aspiration for it down the track. So the first is the complete purity of environment. Then we have the complete purity of body, the complete purity of resources, 
and the complete purity of activities. So a version of all of these are found in all four classes of Tantra. So whether it's lower Tantra like Medicine Buddha or highest Yoga Tantra like Haruka or anything in between, you're gonna find these four purities, even if they're not explicitly labeled in the text itself, they're part of that behind the scenes structure. So the complete purity of the environment is the abode of the deity, the abode of the Buddha that you're practicing. So this is the mandala or the celestial mansion. And all of us have probably seen Buddhist mandalas and just think, oh, that's pretty. Yeah, or maybe it's symbolic of something, but actually what it is is like a mind map to help you connect with different qualities that you've studied and practiced and to kind of hold as many of them in your mind simultaneously as you can. And when you're doing the complete purity of environment, the visualizations are really elaborate with attendant deities and architectural structures and beautiful designs we imagine the mandala as our present reality. This is part of losing the sense of ordinariness. So here's an example, and this is the Medicine Buddha mandala. Mandalas are usually depicted flat, like blueprints, but you actually visualize them in three dimensions. So this idea of losing the ordinariness, this is part of how Tantra purifies the mind. You purify the mind in Tantra through trying to overcome ordinary appearance, which is the symptom of grasping at inherent existence, and the grasping that believes in all the projections of your ignorance. So you transform that by recalibrating your projections and trying to see things as already pure and perfect. And at present, we see the places where we live and work as ordinary with good and bad features. By purifying into emptiness and then visualizing our environment as perfect, we are bringing the result into the present by feeling we are already a Buddha in a Buddha's perfect environment. So I'm guessing that already you can see what kind of pitfalls and dangers there would be. You know, if you start kind of going around like a cruisy surfer dude saying, oh, it's all good, it's all good, it's all perfect, it's fine, it's paradise. That is not what we're talking about. We're not talking about spiritual bypassing. We're not talking about some sort of rose-colored glasses, like sugary, sweet, plastic thinking. What we're talking about is projecting and visualizing the universe as it will be, once the great enlightenment is achieved. So not just our own enlightenment, but the enlightenment of every single sentient being, which is going to happen in the future. It'll take some time, right? We've got to wait for Hitler. Like he's got a lot of purification to do. It's going to take ages, right? But you know, like eventually all sentient beings will become Buddhas and in the purity of our minds becoming enlightened minds, all environments will be pure as well. So you're, you know, it's not like, I guess, what you can worry about is that, you know, it sounds like abundance or prosperity gospel in the fundamentalist evangelical Christian church. It's not like manifesting in new age psychology, but there's some elements that are similar. And, you know, I'm saying, you know, evangelical fundamentalist Christian and new age psychology in a slightly pejorative sort of tone. And, you know, please um, accept my apology. It's just where I'm at. <laughs> I'll come into some more resonance with respecting those paths in the fullness of time. But the danger I see in both of those is some sort of talking over the top of the suffering of reality like you're sort of throwing a blanket on the pain of things and then like putting some like sugary icing over the top and saying, it's a cake, you know, and it's like on a heap of compost and it's reeking and there's flies everywhere, but you're like, no, oh, it's a cake. It's a cake. You know, it feels dangerous, that kind of thinking. Right. And people that are in that kind of thinking can get a weird superiority complex or start to kind of talk as if, any bad thing that happens to you is some fault in your thinking. There is an element of truth to that and an element of too much, 
right? Like we can create conditions for our own ill health by stressing ourselves out. That's scientifically proven, right? You're too stressed, you're gonna get sick. That's gonna happen. But the cause of your sickness is karma created in the past. The condition is your current state of mind that ripened it. So if you hadn't had that current state of mind of constant stress and anger and angst, you wouldn't have watered that seed for sickness. But you didn't make that seed for sickness necessarily in this life, and you never deserve the pain you get. It's just a natural consequence, cause and result. Karma is not fate, not destiny, not punishment, not reward. Okay, we know that. So when we're doing Tantra, what we're doing is living on this razor's edge of imagining and trying to believe the story of our imagination while at the same time knowing it's not true in the conventional world. And it's a very delicate balance and it takes a lot of kind of merit and thought and reasonableness and grounding together with a very flexible mind that can kind of meet some magic. And, you know, when you're practicing Tantra, it's a little clunky at first. It feels a little artificial. It feels weird to think, oh, everything's the mandala. I'm in the celestial mansion. But in the beginning, you just do it on your cushion. Yeah, you're just practicing in your sadhana session during your meditation practice. And then when you stand up, things go back to normal. And occasionally you remember to bring in a tantric vow or to, excuse me, a tantric view. But it's not like you just magically start seeing the world that way. But it's a little bit like if you're listening for wisdom or you're listening for advice or you're listening for answers, you start to hear them, yeah? Whereas when you're shut off and you think, I don't get any support, I'll never be supported, guess what, no support. The tantric view is, again, about opening up those receptor sites to the spectrum of possibilities. And the whole psychology relies on the fundamental premise that all things are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. So that means it's like a space of infinite possibility. You're going to see a lot of references in Tantra to purifying and emptiness. And it's not like you're making things empty. It's that you're remembering that they are. And in remembering that they are, you're kind of reopening your own mind's awareness of the possibilities of things. So it's kind of, it's cosmic stuff, right? And it's, it takes a lot of thought and it's easy to go down the wrong road with it. But the force purity is the pure abode of the deity, the celestial mansion. And so when you see these mandalas, think we're kind of creating a perfected world for a meditation session. We're also creating a mind map in order to anchor ourselves in the qualities we've been studying you know, things like generosity and patience and love and all the good stuff that you already believe in and care about, you're rooting it in an image. And that helps you more closely focus in that image. Yeah. If you're meditating on compassion analytically, you can do it. But if you're meditating on compassion analytically together with an image, sometimes your mind likes that more. Yeah, to have an image and a thought. And sometimes you can have an image and a thought and then also a sound, a mantra, an image, a thought, and a sound, and an idea. And all of these things coming together is this multitasking meditation that we do in Tantra, which accumulates a lot more merit a lot more quickly. And for modern people, sometimes multitasking meditation of this type is actually easier than single-pointed attention on something as simple as the breath because we're already multitasking so much in the day anyway. You're just giving yourself many virtuous projects to do. So you're kind of using all of your senses for your path rather than feeling at war with your senses in order to focus on your path. So it's, it's a lot to take in and some of you um, haven't studied Tantra at all, but just kind of like let it brew, let it, you know, kind of think about it for a while. And none of this is stuff that you have to do or should do, don't do this until you have the empowerment anyway. It's just knowing that it's behind the scenes in a lot of these practices that we've been doing is this kind of like, again, as I said, internal scaffolding or like background structure. 
So that's the complete purity of environment. Then we get the complete purity of body, which is the physical form of the deity developed through what's called self-generation. And self-generation is seeing yourself as the particular deity that you're practicing. And you only do this if you have the specific empowerment of that specific deity. And that carries with it the support and blessings of the lineage, the support and blessings of the guru. And practicing these things without the empowerment can cause a lot of obstacles. Um, and it's also in a way a bit disrespectful because you haven't been given like permission and um, you're not held in the same way. So for example, in the Medicine Buddha Puja, there's no point at which you do self-generation explicitly. Yeah, but when you look at the Medicine Buddha Sadhana, there is a point where all the Medicine Buddhas dissolve into you and then you arise as Medicine Buddha. So if you're doing the Sadhana and you don't have the empowerment, what you do is you just shift the visualization you think all the medicine Buddhas dissolve into you and then medicine Buddha arises in the space in front or at the crown of your head. So the point when you're doing these adjustments as a beginner is just never think I am medicine Buddha. Don't do the self-generation until you have the empowerment, but know that the people that do the empowerment, they actually do see themselves literally as medicine Buddha doing the actions of medicine Buddha. Yeah, Lorna, go ahead. Um, I'm not understanding the empowerment and how that happens and how you get it. And could you explain that a little bit, please? Hmm. So empowerments or initiations or abhishekata or wong, those are all synonyms. 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 No, I'm not going to be able to say it. I'm too tired. Jet lag. You know what I'm talking about. They mean the same thing. So it's a ceremony, basically. It's a ceremony where the guru, the Vajra guru, who has a connection with the unbroken oral tradition of that deity from the time of the Buddha until now, does a series of ceremonial processes inviting you into the mandala, inviting you into the practice, and giving you permission and blessings to do the practice. Logistically, they're usually one to three days. Yeah. So a short one will be like an afternoon. If you're doing Yamantaka with Lamazobi Rinpoche, it may take five days. Who knows how long it will take? It will be a whole thing, but there will be, you know, breaks to have snacks. Don't worry. And you can go to the bathroom. Um, nothing that weird happens in an empowerment, except that you're reciting back a lot of Tibetan words that you might not know what they mean. Basically, what you're saying is, I agree, I accept this process. I agree, I accept that process. I agree to have refuge. I agree to have bodhicitta. I want bodhisattva vows. I want tantric vows, depending on your empowerment. And bodhisattva vows are something that you take in lower tantra practices, and you can totally study them ahead of time and see, do you like them? And bodhisattva vows are beautiful. You'll totally like them. Like the first one is to refrain from praising oneself and criticizing others. And you think that's fantastic. How will I get through the day? I shan't speak, right? <laughs> right. But you know, um, they're beautiful. They're aspirational. You can purify them if you make mistakes. Bodhisattva vows are beautiful. Tantric vows, on the other hand, you can't study until you take them. And if you were to study them, they would not make a lot of sense. So don't study tantric vows until you have them, but you're not going to be asked to like sacrifice animals or do something queer, like yucky or something. Okay, don't worry. It's not like dodgy. It'll all be in alignment with ethics. But tantric vows require commentary to understand fully. So it's not a good idea to read them beforehand because you'll develop obstacles and worry and confusion. And then the empowerment kind of won't take root in your mind properly. So lower Tantra, like Medicine Buddha, you don't have to worry about Tantric vows. You won't get Tantric vows. You'll just get the permission to practice Medicine Buddha, the connection with that teacher, and um, Bodhisattva vows. So that's a fairly, it's kind of along the way in the, in the um, path. Like it's- The empowerment. Fairly adva advanced, is it? Well, you know, it, it's, 
Yes, it is, but only in the sense of, you know, you don't have to feel like you have to be an amazing meditator yet. What you need is conviction and understanding and respect in the three principal aspects of the path. You know, ideally you'd have a realization of the three principal aspects of the path. But for us nowadays, you understand renunciation, the determination to be free. You believe it's important. You understand bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment. You think it's important. You understand the correct view of emptiness that all things lack inherent existence because they dependently arise. And you know that it's important to remember that. Those three are the criteria for kind of getting ready for Tantra. And it goes without saying that you'd have Buddhist refuge. Um, the big thing is the teacher. And whoever you take the empowerment from becomes your Vajra guru, who you're going to have a karmic connection with until the end of time. Choose them wisely. Make sure they have solid ethics that you really can trust them. Um, don't rely on fame or name. Do your own checking. Um, lots of really amazing Vajra gurus out there, but also a lot of very dodgy ones. So got to be careful, sadly, degenerate age. <laughs> degenerate okay, age. Great. Thank you so yeah. much. For practices like Green Tara, Medicine Buddha, Chen Rezig, these are all tantric practices. They're all lower tantric practices. And you don't have to be a tantric practitioner to practice them in the introductory way. You just know that you're kind of building a relationship with the energies they embody. You're building a relationship with the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas. And really you're just tuning into what that practice emphasizes. So if you're doing Chen Rezig, you're really tuning into compassionate wisdom. If you're doing Medicine Buddha, you're tuning into healing energy, Tara, action and protection. The things in the sadhana that don't make sense or the things in the puja that don't make sense, some of them are easily revealed and are open information to anybody. Some of them you have to wait for the empowerment to get the full story. But the main thing is don't see yourself as the deity until you have permission to see yourself as the deity and the empowerment is that permission. Yeah. Um, yes, so anyway, <laughs> empowerment's in a nutshell. All right, so um, pure the complete purity of body, you're training in de-identifying from your physical form a little bit here as well. Sometimes people get trapped in the form and they think, oh, how can I practice medicine Buddha? I'm a woman, he's a man, don't get too ordinary, right? You're also not blue, you know? What you're doing is shifting identification to something that is actually more real. The Buddha that you will become is more real than how you see yourself now. How you see yourself now is very much about your family of origin, your ethnicity, your gender, your socioeconomic status, your level of education, how funny you think you are, how smart you think you are, your traumas, your triumphs, you know, all of this stuff of this life that you kind of cobble together and call your personality and yourself is new, relatively speaking. This consciousness has existed from beginningless time. It's only had this name and form and history for however many decades. What you've had the whole time is your Buddha nature. This consciousness has always had Buddha potential. So what you're doing is identifying as your future self rather than your false self. Yeah, the false self is this facade that you identify with now who is not you at all this bag of bones, this series of facts. They live here, you function within them, but they are not you. If you were to pick any aspect of what you call your personality and unpack it a little bit, you'd realize it was learned, it was conditioned, it was experientially created, and none of it came from you by you all by yourself. Yeah. Tricky, but true. You know, tricky, but true. So, you know, that can make you feel kind of lost in where am I, who am I? But your consciousness exists, has existed, will exist. And it's always been empty of inherent existence, which is very good news 
because that means it can transform into a Buddha's mind. Yeah. So by identifying as the Buddha you will become, you can say the Buddha I will become will be Medicine Buddha who is blue in color and looks like this, but you're not getting trapped in the form of it. You're just thinking of the perfected version of your own mind kind of creating these kinds of forms. So the pure, the complete purity of body is the second one. This, kind, this is what's called deity yoga, seeing yourself as the deity, seeing the environment as the abode of the deity. Deity yoga reinforces the entire path. So for example, practicing calm abiding or shine shamatha with a Buddha's body is helpful as it accustoms you to the meritorious appearance of a Buddha body. So you're doing two things at once. You're multitasking so much in Tantra. You're developing calm abiding by having a steady mind on the image of yourself as the Buddha, but then you're also accumulating virtue by meditating on a virtuous image. So then in deity yoga, a single moment of consciousness apprehends the divine form of a deity while at the same time being clearly aware of its empty nature. So in this case, both meditation on the deity and an apprehension of emptiness coexist in complete form within a single cognitive moment. Such a moment of consciousness therefore contains both of the two factors of method and wisdom. So you're, you know, in the sutra path, you're accumulating the accumulation of merit or method by loving kindness, compassion, all that accessible, beautiful stuff. And then as a separate project, you're developing the wisdom, realizing emptiness. In Tantra, you're doing them both simultaneously from the very beginning. So it's the wisdom that realizes this special type of emptiness, the emptiness of the deity specifically, that eventually serves as the substantial cause for the omniscient mind of Buddhahood. So it's not as if we slip a deity body on top of this imperfect body, like some rubber suit. We actually feel that we are the deity and that our body is the divine body of the deity. With this level of identification with the deity, we have the power to completely purify our sense of ordinariness. Whereas where the sutrayana chips away at our delusions, here we blast them into non-existence with the power of our pure visualizations. So in the beginning stages, one just imitates and imagines, but there are actually people who can maintain deity yoga continuously. In all activities, they are to their own mind appearing as the deity. So that's the complete purity of the body. Do you have any questions about the environment and the body so far? Is it just is it um, interesting background knowledge, or are you getting lost and frustrated? Anybody lost and frustrated? It's okay if you are. No, all good. Okay, <laughs> all right. So more background scaffolding, and um, this will come in handy if you keep practicing these practices. Um, you might come back to it and go, oh. So we're planting seeds. Now we've got the complete purity of resources. And this ties into a number of rituals in Tibetan Buddhism and um, is an important thing to understand. So this is the divine objects and enjoyments of the deity. In Vajrayana practice, we, as the deity, make offerings of flowers, incense, light, and so forth to the deity. So what we're doing here is thinking about resources differently. Right now, when you think about like the things in your fridge that you're excited about, right? There's things in your fridge you don't care about, but there's things in your fridge you're a little excited about, right? There's like a chocolate mousse in the back there you're hanging out for or something, yummy yogurt or something, right? If you're thinking about your resources that you have attachment towards, can, just by imagining them, can you conjure up like a tiny bit of like anticipation bliss? Like if you think of your favorite food and it being just over there, can part of you already have the happiness of that food prior to eating it? Sort of like an imaginative way, 
right? You can anticipate the deliciousness, yeah? And what you're doing is you're taking the sort of bliss of the anticipation of the deliciousness and then taking away your attachment, your craving, your miserliness, but keeping the anticipatory bliss, yeah? And what you're saying is that that wonderful resource, that wonderful bliss I'm offering to the guru deity, not because they want or need it, but in order to get rid of my attachment to it. And then as a result, it's going to come back to me anyway. I'll get to enjoy it anyway. And then that bliss kind of resolves itself, but without all of the afflictions. So we're going to do Guru Puja Sog in a couple of weeks. But some of you have seen Lama Chopa Guru Puja Sog, where there's all sorts of smells and bells and chanting and delicious things all over the altar. And some of those things are like totally junk food, you know, like chips and chocolate. And like you think Buddhists, like, shouldn't we have like a vegan casserole or something? Like, why do we have these like junk food things on the altar? And it's because there are things that trigger craving. There's no sense in trying to use something that doesn't trigger craving to get over craving. You need to have things that will trigger craving in order to start working with them in this way. And then what happens? You offer them during the puja, right? You offer them with a whole bunch of verses to a whole bunch of divine beings. And then later, everybody gets them, right? Bags of delicious things wind up in your lap and you go, hooray, right? Or, oh no, my diet's blown. But, you know, like they come back to you. So this, this is the sort of psychology that we're looking at with the purity of resources, where you create beautiful things, you have very elaborate altars of delicious things, and you imagine how wonderful they are, offering how wonderful they are, and then they come back to you. And this creates the cause for pure resources in the future. Yeah, it's an interesting psychology to start playing with. So it's taking the same old offering practice that you do in the sutra tradition and just elevating it. So these are ordinary objects, but we do not offer ordinary objects to the deity. What we do is we see these offering objects as divine objects and the action of offering as a divine action. So this is kind of the common setup that you see on the altar these water bowls. And what you basically have is water for washing, water for drinking, flowers, incense, light, perfume, food, and music. And these are the traditional things in ancient India that you would offer a VIP coming to your house, right? If a fancy person was coming to your house, you would wash their feet, you would give them a drink, you would put flower garlands over them, you'd wave incense around to kind of get rid of the toilet smell, right? You'd light all the candles, you'd, add, you'd sort of offer them perfume to their chest, you'd give them a feast of food and you'd play beautiful music. So these are like the sensory enjoyments that you offer the best of the best of the best in celebration and in invitation. And from our perspective, then we think, who is the best guest to our house? The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So we offer them all these things, but also we think that we are coming together with the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and identifying with them and as them. So we partake in this celebration as well, all the time remembering it's empty of inherent existence so as not to fall into the desirous attachment kind of vortex that we normally do with enjoyment objects. So in practices, you'll see this sort of thing. This is from the Long Medicine Buddha Sadhana, these kind of offering garland verses. It says the first line, Om Sawatatagata Sapariwari Agyam Pujamega Samuchas Parana Samayash Yehum. And you think, what? And what it is, is one by one going through those offerings. So one by one, you can see there's the agyam, padyam, pupe, dupe, aloke, gande, nude, shapta that you looked at before in this one. Yeah, agyam, padyam, pupe. So it's, they're embedded within these garland verses, which basically say, to you, Guru Medicine Buddha, I offer water for washing, please accept it. To you, Guru Medicine Buddha, I offer water for drinking. Please accept it, etc. So this is where you'll see the offerings actually being made within practice manuals. And um, 
you know, the offering garland's gonna adjust to suit whatever deity you're practicing, but that's what's going on there. These guys are getting offered. Okay. So then when they are visualized and offered with a strong sense of emptiness and hopefully a strong bodhicitta motivation, they become incredibly potent. Also, the resources we use while we're doing Vajrayana practice are transformed into pure substances. Everything we eat, drink, wear, everything we feel or sense, everything our mind comes into contact with is not seen as ordinary objects of the senses, but as divine. Seeing everything that arises to our consciousness as extraordinary develops our potential to experience joy or bliss. So Tantra isn't making you separate yourself from the joys of samsara. It's using the joys of samsara to even fuel your practice and you become even more kind of happy and feelings of abundance and bliss, but you're getting rid of all of your attachment to it by continuously remembering emptiness. So for this resources section, this is where you will hear the om ah hum syllables recited like before meals or as one does fills the offering bowls. We practice thinking that the substances are purified by remembering emptiness, transformed into pure substances, and increased into an ocean of uncontaminated nectar. So you're often going to hear people say oma hum, oma hum, oma hum before, excuse me, before eating, and then as they fill water bowls, etc. That's what that's about. And oma hum refers to enlightened body, enlightened speech, and enlightened mind. So that's the complete purity of resources. Um, is there anything about that one or about offerings that you've seen laid out on altars or um, seen laid out in practices that you were curious about? Yeah. So, you know, this whole purity of resources thing, it's kind of like, I don't know, if you're putting on like a fuzzy bathrobe and you're thinking, oh, it's so fuzzy and gorgeous. I love the feeling of the fuzzy on my skin. This is so lovely. And then you think, which is empty of inherent existence. If it wasn't empty of inherent existence, everyone would feel exactly the same way I feel in this moment, including myself on days where I'm absent-minded and not really thinking about the sensation on my skin and I'm just throwing it on as I go to my breakfast, right? So you're enjoying while remembering emptiness, which does not diminish your enjoyment at all. It keeps you from being attached to it. Yeah. And then the last one is the complete purity of activities. And these are the various actions of generosity of ourselves as the deity. And this can take a lot of aspects in the sadhana practices and in the puja practices. But the most classic one is sending and gathering light rays from the mantra as we recite the mantra. So during Vajrayana practice, the sadhana will instruct us to do many things to benefit sentient beings. These are the pure activities of the deity. And as we have visualized ourselves as that deity, these are also our activities. So as with the mandala, even though normally um, you see the mantra garland kind of flat circle, here you visualize it standing upright. So in Sutrayana, we practice generosity, but the generosity practiced in Vajrayana can be far more extensive because it's not an ordinary human, but a divine deity giving things, money, teaching, so forth to all sentient things. Whatever we do, we try to experience as divine. So that's the complete purity of activities. So these four complete purities, um, this is again related to engaging in a path with similar features to the resultant state of Buddhahood, especially the form body. It has great significance and power. It's also indispensable. And then in order to achieve this resultant state, that is the union of the two enlightened bodies, it's essential to engage in a path characterized by the union of method and wisdom. This fact is accepted by all Mahayana schools. 
So when you see the two enlightened bodies, we're talking about the form bodies and the truth bodies, or the rupakayas and the dharmakayas, which can be further subdivided. And when you hear bodies or kayas, what you're talking about is collections of qualities that an enlightened being has. I guess when, you, when you're looking at these four Buddha bodies, I guess what you have to remember is that these are results of practice. The form bodies are, are the result of the method category. The wisdom bodies are the result of wisdom practices and wisdom accumulations. And we need these kind of collections of qualities or these bodies of qualities in order to benefit ourselves and in order to benefit others. So we practice deity yoga. Deity yoga is the practice of the four complete purities. And these are all embedded behind all these tantric practices, whether it's explicitly said or not. Questions? Too much? A little bit too much, possibly. Sorry, it was fast. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. It, just getting to the point of saturation, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. good. <laughs> but it, a thought occurred to me, all all sentient beings will eventually attain Buddhahood is a, yes. is the postulate. So yes. do they have to go through the human form to get there? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. I suppose. I don't know for sure, but a human body is particularly useful for Tantra because of the channels, winds and drops. And so it makes it a more conducive sort of platform. But beings also become enlightened in the Bardo, also become enlightened in pure lands. So the question is, can you bypass the human rebirth and go straight from animal to pure realm? And Theoretically, I would think yes, but they would have had to have created the cause for that in some form that they were in. So may, I guess I think the answer would be possibly, but we'd have to check with the Lama. Yeah. Like, for example, I mean, there's Nagas who are very sentient, who study really well, who practice really well, you know, who are just not human beings, but they're, you know, perfectly um, capable. Um, the question is, do they have access to the same teachings? Maybe. Yeah. So I'm well, not sure. Yeah. I was just thinking a, a story came to mind that could be written about this. Uh, hmm. the very, if they all had to go through human beings, then what happens when there are just a few left? Yeah, right. What, what, what's, what's it like then? That's all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I guess, you know, the, uh, the now we're getting into the wild and woolly esoteric ver version of Buddhism, but know that we don't think Earth is the only planet with life. Yeah, there's four planets for sure that have life that we talk about, and they're talked about in the mandala offering even. They're called continents, but really they're planets with life. So um, fun fact. And we're not like trapped on the planet we were born on. You know, when we die, we might be reborn on a different one. But that's getting into like wild alien Buddhist conversations. And, you know, it's a little far out. Well, I, I like to go there. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, why not? <laughs> why not? The Abhidharma Kosha is wild. <laughs> All sorts of stuff like that. Yeah. So anyway, aliens. So if we run out of people, we'll just be aliens. It's fine. They're, they have Buddha nature too. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Other thoughts? What, what's coming up for you guys as as we talk about these four purities? Any kind of like insights and connections, or worries or confusions? I might need to kind of process for a while. Yeah, Skylar, go ahead. Thinking about yeah, these purities. Um, I uh, I have social anxiety. I got to a point where I got over it. COVID happened. And yes, I was right back to square one. They called me back to the office. Oh my gosh, it was, it was hell, um, literally. I've been working with it. I've been trying to do all of this different stuff. Um, and I'm trying to uh, like re-arise as that person that I was before COVID. Yeah. Um, trying to think about you know, the tantric stuff. And, but I'm also trying to do as like, and maybe it's like a little bit of spiritual bypassing, but I'm almost like, you know, 
I was fine in my spiritual solitary retreat. And these gods came and asked me to manifest in the city to teach the people, right? And I'm like, I'm telling my boss, no, I don't want to go. I can't teach them. They are so deluded. No. And I manifest in the office. And even though from my side, I'm like, I don't want to be here. I hate it. I'm in hell. People are coming up to me and they're like, oh, just to view your beautiful body is amazing. And it brings smile to my face. And, you know, and I'm like trying to, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) And it's like, okay, where does the delusion start and where does it stop? You know, it's like my anxiety was overlaying this, like everybody's out to kill me. Mm. My Buddhist teaching is overlaying this everybody wants to help me so it's it's it does get really tricky how it's like marrying the two and like knowing that you know there's the potential that they could hurt me but there's also the potential that they could help me immensely and I could help them like, the, the question becomes, what is going to move your mind towards enlightenment? Because at our level, we can't know, are these ordinary beings with delusions or are they Buddhas pretending to be ordinary beings with delusions and in order for us to practice in a certain way and to get over things like our social anxiety? Like, sometimes it's helpful for me to think I'm the last sentient being left and everyone else is a Buddha collaborating, trying to get me to wake up. Because it could be the case, right? Like it could be that all of you are Buddhas trying to get me to teach this class. So I'll teach myself it again and eventually integrate it, right? Who can say, right? And, you know, who can say? Who can say? But the question becomes, what is the most useful framework for you to operate within and know that you can't know? Yeah, and to just kind of like, fall into the freedom of whether they're ordinary suffering sentient beings or whether they're Buddhas manifesting in a way to teach me at the end of the day, all suffering and all happiness can be fuel for my path or not. I get to decide. No one is sending me a lesson. I'm choosing to see things as a lesson. You know, like, like it's somehow being empowered enough to feel like you're in charge of your own path at a pace and at a speed that's, you know, useful to you, that's not pushing it too hard. So you're able to say, you know, today I need to work from home. Today I can work in the workplace, knowing your levels of ability, you know, and not feeling ashamed of yourself, not over identifying with your afflictions, just knowing where you are on any given day. Today, do I have the wherewithal to cope with all of the countless appearances of my samsaric mind? or not. And if not, okay, that's all right. I've got a computer. You know, it, it's, it's just that delicate dance of realizing that we are different day to day to day and our capabilities shift and adjust. And part of the anxiety, I think, is over identification with who we are at our best. We often think of ourselves in our best version on the best day when everything's gone well and we've had a perfect night's sleep and our digestion's operating fine and our hormones are perfectly settled and everyone's being nice to us. And that one day when we were this like benevolent, funny, charismatic, intelligent helper of sentient beings and we think that is me, why don't I ever live up to that? When in fact, that was just a really good day. That's not how you are normally who you are normally is completely fine. It's just that you have this expectation of living up to you at your best. So you're going to be constantly disappointed. You know, so yeah. Being in lockdown, I was always at my best, you know, I I am me and I would, you know, do my little fit that they wouldn't see. And then I'd calm down and I am them. So it was like, I was always at my best. And now, yeah, it's like, I'm out there like you know almost like an actress improvising now like I'm doing this improv now I'm not going off of script I'm not yeah it's 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 the balance between being self-aware but not self-conscious 
Yeah. Self-aware, you can have such yeah. a sense of humor about your own stuff and not be self-deprecating in a way that's unkind to yourself. You're just acknowledging, my goodness, my afflictions are absurd. Yep, they are. That doesn't mean I'm bad. They're hilarious. I'm full of hypocrisy and absurdity. Oh, well, people may see it. Oh, well, right? Like there, there's a freedom in not identifying with your mess while still taking responsibility for it. And our society sort of says you have to take responsibility and identify with it. And so then life is so painful. But all of our stuff, we came by it honest, right? Did your mother, mother ever tell you that, right? She came by it honest, right? They're a bit of a jerk, but he came by it honest, right? Like everyone makes sense given their context. So, you know, you just kind of give yourself a bit of a break. And remembering emptiness can free up that kind of realm of possibility to kind of move into a more tantric space of inviting the divine from people as well. It's like if you're looking for their delusions and you're looking for their suffering, you will see their delusions and suffering. But if you're looking for their wisdom and you're looking for their kindness, it kind of invites it to the forefront if they're in the mood for it without pressure or expectations, you know? But it can really have an interesting effect if you start listening for different things and watching for different things and having that self-awareness that's not self-conscious because self-consciousness is just over-identification. Yeah. Um, but yeah, best of luck with it. Oh, thank you, Venerable Youngton. I think you answered part of it just now. My question was, um, what are the words that describe the, the greatest obstacles to moving into this tantric kind of emptiness you know attachment self-consciousness you just said that when you said attachment you know what are the afflictions that are most is it all of them or are there particular afflictions to that sort of a of, of a mind shift well the technical framing is that tantra helps us overcome ordinary appearance and grasping so ordinary appearance is our projections onto things, right? The decoration of inherent existence, the thinking that things exist in and of themselves from their own side, divorced from context, divorced from their parts, just as they are, that default setting we have that grasps at inherent existence and projects inherent existence. So the fact that things appear truly existent wouldn't be a problem if we didn't grasp onto it. But we both have the appearance that's false and we buy into it and reinforce it. So the tantric view is helping both the symptom and the cause. So it's uprooting ignorance in kind of a twofold manner, the symptoms of our ignorance as well as the root of our ignorance. So overcoming ordinary appearance and grasping, you, you stop believing that everything is as you project it to be through your filters of ignorance by thinking, all is empty of inherent existence. And yet I've experienced bliss and happiness and pleasure despite it lacking inherent existence. So bringing that awareness of bliss, joy and emptiness, now I'm gonna dissolve my current appearances and then reproject in a way that will be my future. And that's a way of purifying this problem of ordinary appearance and grasping simultaneously. So it only works if you project an appearance of pure, the four complete purities, right? Abode and body and resources and activity while remembering emptiness. Because if you don't remember emptiness, you can get too literal and get kind of weird, <laughs> right? And I've seen it happen, right? Um, but anyway, ordinary appearance and grasping are what are overcome by the tantric view. So that's why it's dangerous, is it can get, yeah. I yeah, it can get sense. weird. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So renunciation and bodhicitta will help keep you from the weird, but remembering emptiness is always your fail safe. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Diane, did you have one? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, 
you know, sometimes when you're at teachings or so you, you know, you kind of end up being at a Janang, um, like it just kind of everything all of a sudden comes oh, together. Right. It's not, you walked into it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not like it's um, super explained. So um, I'm just curious, like the four purities that you've been talking about, I mean, those things we'd still be working towards if we had uh, taken them. Um, yeah, yeah. Jinang, um, what, what Diane's talking about is one of these subsequent permissions um, that lamas will sometimes give. It's called a Jainang and uh, Wong means empowerment. Jainang means subsequent empowerment. Basically it's a, uh, about a two to five hour ceremony um, to permission to practice one of the deities. And what can happen is that you just hear the Lama's giving a green Tara Jen, a Jainong or Janang, right? Jainong. And you just rock up and now people are chanting and bowing and taking sips of saffron water and various implements are being bonked on your head and you're repeating after the teacher and you're like, Evidently, I've taken the green tower at Jainong. Evidently, I was there, I guess, right? And often the first time you do these kind of empowerments, um, you're a little bewildered and a little kind of out to sea. And um, yeah, and you just happen to be at the right place at the right time. And what you do is then you think, well, if it's a practice I want to practice, I can always take the empowerment again, deeper, more committed, more focused now that I've seen it. And you were at the Jainong, and if you thought at any point, I would like this Jainong, <laughs> if you thought that at any point during the ceremony, I would like this, then you have it. If you were in the room and the ceremony happened and the whole time you were thinking, what, what? I don't know if I want to be here. I don't know what on earth's going on. I feel very uncomfortable. Or this is an interesting spectacle that I'm going to watch as an observer. Then you didn't take the Jainong. So it's not like you can be involuntarily given an empowerment, right? You have to be an active participant <laughs> and think, yes, I want it. Yeah. So if at some point you thought, yes, I would like this empowerment, you have that empowerment. Now you have permission to practice that deity the sadhanas of that deity, you can look them up in the FPMT shop, but it also means you can start reading the commentaries which explain how to bring the four complete purities to that text that doesn't necessarily explicitly signpost them. So you also have permission to look at the commentaries. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Did that answer your question or were you trying? Yeah, to angle? yeah, yeah. did. Yeah, it's a gradual process, and a lot of us enter Tantra somewhat randomly, inelegantly, clunky, and are just trying to figure it out. But in a perfect world, you know, you'd be prepared and intentional and request and have thought about it, but that doesn't often happen, to be honest. You're just at a Dharma center long enough, you get swept up in the whole thing. Yeah, it happens. Um, you know, the thing is, is to just really ask yourself, do you want to make that deep of connection with Tantra and with that teacher? Yeah. And it's not enough to just want to make a connection with that teacher. It's not enough to just want to make a connection with that deity. Both have to come together. Other questions or thoughts, miscellaneous Tantra? Well, if it's miscellaneous, um, do you know of any good commentaries on Chakra Samvara Haruka to understand it better? Yes, um, check out the Dei Chen Ling um, website, Dei Chen Ling. There's a, a really obvious one. I think it's by Babanka Rinpoche or Trijang Rinpoche, but um, anyway, it'll be obvious once you're on the Dei Chen Ling website. Um, also, you can get the free Lama Zopa Rinpoche one called A Teaching on Haruka off the Long Yeah, I, I, have, I have that one, but it doesn't go, to, it's, I want more like the, you know, like the stuff yeah. you're talking about here and the symbology and that's yeah. more just sort of general. Yeah, uh, no, the Dei Ling Press one. It's a, it's a good one. I, yeah, I recommend it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, Cindy? Cindy. Hi, Venerable Yantin. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Um, I have a question with regard to empowerment and the connection to the teacher. Mm -hmm. um, if you stumble into, let's say, a Medicine Buddha empowerment, um, and you, you receive it and you want it, but you don't want the connection to the teacher. 
What do you do? Um, cannot have one without the other. So would it be that you would uh, perhaps take the empowerment again with a teacher you do feel connected to or exactly. would connect yeah. to? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. And, if, you know, and if you've taken an empowerment from someone and you find out things about them later that are troubling, you know, that are unethical or something. Very it's like the connection has been made. So just be a little bit careful with how you think about them and, and try not to drift into anger. But that's not to say you ever have to say bad behavior is good, right? The pure view of Tantra is not pretending that bad behavior is good. You can say the bad behavior is somehow a teaching for me to not do bad behavior. It could be that, yeah. or it could be they're an ordinary being with delusions doing bad things, but I'm not going to actually go that direction if I've already taken an empowerment. I can say, okay, that was a bad behavior. The display of the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas did this bad behavior in order for what? What would be a virtuous reason? For me to create policy in my organization for these things never to happen again, for, you know, blah, 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 whatever, like practical ethical solutions, right? But so if you've made a, a karmic connection with one of these teachers that turned out to be dodgy in their appearances, just be a little delicate and try and really hold, hold respect while still being able to criticize behavior, um, which is a good rule of thumb for all people at all times anyway. It's just particularly relevant if you've made a tantric connection. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There's a few really good Tantra commentaries. Um, if you're preparing or thinking about doing this kind of thing, or if you've entered into Tantra, but you're a bit lost and it's still quite new. Um, so really good resources. Um, the World of Tibetan Buddhism by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. It sounds like it's gonna be like a Lam Rim text or an introduction text, but it's actually goes through the four classes of Tantra in quite a bit of detail. So this one by His Holiness is very clear and it's really thorough, the world of Tibetan Buddhism. Then Tantra in this Foundation of Buddhist Thought series by Geshe Teshi Sering. This one is um, fairly technical and it has some things that maybe are good to wait until you have empowerment to actually read, like the highest yoga tantra section, maybe wait to read until you have highest yoga tantra. But um, it does explain a lot of the um, nuances and variations of practice and flexibilities in practice and approaches to practice in a really beautiful way for the lower tantras and just context for tantra in general. So that it's a really good resource. And then we have this handbook of Tibetan Buddhist symbols, I think I mentioned earlier in the class by Robert Beer. And this one goes through like the hand implements and the mudras and various things that you see in tantric iconography. Um, it'll talk about kind of the thought behind them as well as like the history of why that came to represent that. Now, the one that is the classic is Introduction to Tantra by Lama Yeshi. And it's one of those texts which is found in almost all FPMT centers because it's so rich and so experiential. So this one is not technical. It's very direct and it's very much understanding the tantric psychology. So I really recommend um, all four of those texts if you're curious about um, looking into tantra a bit more. And of course there are more, but those are some four. In the next weekend that we do together, we're gonna to look at Tara Puja and um, Tara in general, um, and a little bit about um, preliminary practices like Jorchu and things like that. And I'm also open to suggestions if there's things, prayers and practices that you've seen in Tibetan Buddhist centers that you're curious about, I can make a point to talk about them. So. Um, can you think of anything on the top of your head that you've been really curious to learn more about that you've seen at Dharma centers? The final weekend we'll be doing Lama Chopa. I'd like to learn a little bit more about fire puja. Fire pujas, yeah, sure. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, that's really interesting stuff to go into. I will make a mental note. Anything else on the list, Amanda? I wouldn't mind finding out if I wanted to make uh, like a little stupa on my property for circumambulation, what yeah. would be involved? Yeah, okay. Yeah, holy objects. Yep, holy object making. Okay, 
yep, those are good ones. We can go through the 21 Taras or not. You know, there, there's also plenty of books where you can look at them one by one and I can, um, free resources on Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive. Um, or we can go through them in class. Um, or if you want to learn about sort of specific ones for anything in particular, we'll just kind of, we can play that by ear or if there's suggestions. Yeah, Lorna, go ahead. Yeah, I'd appreciate uh, going through them because I've started practicing them and I'd like to mm -hmm. understand them better. Okie doke. Yeah, sure. 21 Tara, let's go. All right. I think we can call it a day. So let's go ahead and dedicate. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that is not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. And then the long life prayers, the wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, the incomparably kind Supreme Tenzin Gatso. May you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunath's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers honoring the three sublime ones, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it.